Greetings, everyone. Nathan Cherry here, host of the Silk Road History Podcast. I hope you're all enjoying the Hellenistic Age podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts about the history of the ancient world. And if you enjoy the Hellenistic Age podcast, especially all of those episodes about Alexander's escapades in Afghanistan, India, and Central Asia, then might I suggest taking a listen to my podcast, the Silk Road History Podcast. The Silk Road History Podcast explores the history of the Silk Roads, of course, China, Central Asia, India, and beyond, from the very depths of history to the modern day. On the Silk Road History Podcast, I shine a light onto this much neglected but most fascinating part of history, trying to show in their full glory the bloody battles, daring escapades, larger-than-life characters, and unique and bizarre happenings. As Derek has shown on the Hellenistic Age, the ancient world was deeply interwoven and interconnected, and the Silk Road, or rather the Silk Roads, were what tied it all together. If you like the sound of that, then why not go on over to www.thesilkroadhistorypodcast.com and give the show a listen, or find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. I hope that you'll join me on the next episode of the Silk Road History Podcast. But without further ado, enjoy this episode of the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Hi there, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 24, Pyrrhus Part 1, The World of Epirus and the Early Years, 319 to 296 BC. There is a chance dinner conversation that is recorded by many ancient historians, taking place at the court of the Seleucid king Antiochus III in 193 BC. The event is almost certainly fiction, but in it, Hannibal Barca, the famous Carthaginian general of the Second Punic War, was residing at the court after fleeing Carthage in fear of assassination. The famed Roman general who defeated Hannibal at the Battle of Zama nearly a decade prior, Scipio Africanus, was there on a diplomatic mission and ran into Hannibal. In an effort to either tease Hannibal, or aim for a compliment, or both, Scipio asked him, Who do you think is the greatest general of all time? After deliberating for a moment, Hannibal answered, Alexander the Great as being the first, and then he named himself as the third. In second place, Hannibal had answered Pyrrhus. While this probably wasn't the answer Scipio was looking for, This comment is extremely revealing about the attitudes of the ancients. Born in an age of warring kings in a backwater nation, Pyrrhus would take the eastern Mediterranean by storm through a whirlwind of campaigns and conflicts that would set him head and shoulders above his contemporaries in the cultural consciousness of the Hellenistic world. In this multi-part series, we will take a look at the life of the most famous king of Epirus, and see exactly why Pyrrhus was remembered as the second Alexander. To begin our story, it is important that we understand the background of Pyrrhus' world, Epirus. Ancient Epirus is traditionally located on the western coast of the Balkans and Greek Peninsula, along the eastern border of the Ionian Sea, right next to the island of Corsara, modern Corfu. Functionally, It is split in half between the modern states of southern Albania and northern Greece, its south being some of the most mountainous areas in the region, and its north home to flat plains. It was a hardy land, suited more for pastoralists rather than strict agriculturalists, similar to Macedon. Unfortunately, like Macedon, the origins of the Epirot peoples is a tricky situation to deal with, given that the many nationalist movements of the Balkans have led to controversies regarding its ethnic background. Traditional scholarship has placed the origins of settlement to a proto-Greek-speaking peoples, beginning at the 2nd millennium BC, 
These were different from the Mycenaeans of central and southern Greece, but functionally, it was part of the larger Greek world of the Bronze Age, and they are said to have spoken a different dialect that was still mutually intelligible. Epic poems tell of legendary heroes like Odysseus, Jason, and Aeneas having visited this region, and the site of the Greek world's oldest oracle, the Oracle of Dodona, was of such great renown that only the Oracle of Delphi would supplant it in popularity. By the end of the Bronze Age, roughly 1200 BC, we are at a loss of sources and inscriptions entirely down through the Greek Dark Ages, but we can track the movements of the so-called Dorian Invasion, the series of migrations of Dorian-speaking Greeks who came from the east and gradually assimilated into the indigenous populations, replacing the language spoken by the Mycenaeans into the Doric dialect, used by the Spartans, Corinthians, and the like. What would become the Epirot dialect can almost certainly be traced back to Dorian ancestry, and would remain relatively intelligible with the Greeks of the southern peninsula. So in terms of linguistics, we see a connection with the Greek world, but was it similar in terms of political or cultural attitudes? From our texts, we notice that the Epirots were seen in quite a similar function to how the Greeks saw the Macedonians. At the time of what is called the Archaic Period, roughly the 8th century down to the end of the Second Persian Invasion of Greece in 480 or 479, the political unity of Epirus was virtually non-existent. In lieu of a city-state or polis, the Epirots were divided into several tribal groups, the most prominent being the Thesprotians, the Chionians, and above all else, the Molossians. These tribes were ruled by kings, already a curious characteristic to the standards of most Greeks, but many of them attempted to justify their status as being a Hellene by placing Greek mythological ancestors in their family tree. Olympias, a Molossian princess turned queen of Macedon and the mother of Alexander the Great, claimed that her ancestry stretched back to Neoptolemus, son of Achilles. This story was recounted by the Athenian playwright Euripides in his work The Andromache in the 5th century, who placed the union of Neoptolemus with the Greek princess Andromache, producing the offspring named Molossus, conveniently the founder of the Molossian tribe. The same was done in the Argeid house of Macedon too, so it can be reasonably asserted that the ruling class was accounted as being honorary Greeks, but the common peoples not as much. Their tastes were certainly Philhellene in nature, as we have recovered grave goods and artifacts dating from the Archaic period, which show a gradual introduction of Greek ceramics, jewelry, bronze statues, and the like, but they still retained a level of uncouthness in Greek opinion. The lower class would be poor pastoralists and peasants, and it wouldn't be that far off to take Alexander the Great's speech at Opus about how his father Philip II turned Macedonian goat herders into the finest fighting force in the world and apply that to Epirus. Throughout the 5th century, the interactions between the Epirus and the Greek world would intensify, especially during the Peloponnesian War. They first appear as troops on the side of the Peloponnesian League, acting in support of their longtime allies in the city of Ambracia to the south. The Athenians felt that it was in their best interest to secure good terms with the Epirots, given that the Epirots' location was the key to the breaking up of Peloponnesian defenses along the Ionian Sea before the ill-fated Sicilian expedition could begin. They tried to win brownie points by being among the first cities to recognize Epirots as being Greek, even offering the young Molossian prince Therippus, who was receiving an education in Athens at the time, the privilege of Athenian citizenship. It also explains Euripides' attempt to link Epirus into the mythology of Greece through Neoptolemus' child by way of Andromache. In effect, Macedon and Epirus are almost parallel in their development, given that Macedonian relations were also becoming prominent during the Peloponnesian War. And the turn of the 5th century into the 4th would be the most dramatic transformation of the Epirot and Macedonian states. One of the accelerants of this transformation would come by the way of her northwestern neighbors, a people known as the Illyrians. 
Like many names, Illyrian is a catch-all designation regarding the peoples who dwelled along the coast of the Western Balkans, bordering the Adriatic Sea, a region termed, fittingly enough, Illyria. This region would include modern states like Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Croatia and was distant enough both geographically, culturally, and linguistically from the Greeks that they would be classified as barbarians. We don't know their precise origins, but they were comprised of numerous tribes, much like the Epirots, and were engaged in a mixture of warfare, raiding, trading, and even intermarriage among their southern neighbors. Normally I hesitate to bring in modern controversies to the show, but I need to address it given the murky nature of ethnography colored by modern perceptions. I mentioned earlier the difficulties of talking about this region given that many modern Balkan states and nationalist movements have claimed ancestry to the Illyrians, whether true or not, and by extension ancestry to the Epirots through the marriage of princesses and kings from Epirot tribes to Illyrian ones and vice versa. A prominent example would be Sinane, a half-Illyrian daughter of Philip II, who was apparently taught in the ways of war by her Illyrian mother, and was given the moniker of the Amazonian archetype to horrify Greek eyes. One of the greatest Illyrian kings would be a man called Bartolus, a humble peasant who would consolidate the numerous Illyrian tribes under one banner through military conquest, founding the kingdom of the Dardanians, sometime in the late 5th century BC. Bartolus's reign would be long, at least 50 years, since he died in his 90s, and he would have ample time to transform Illyria into a powerful state, minting currency in the style of his Greek neighbors, reforming the army, and strengthening the unity of the Illyrian peoples. Though prospects may have been improving for the Illyrians, their neighbors in Macedon and Epirus especially were frightened by the growing threat of Bartolus's kingdom and it would only be a matter of time before the king would turn on them. Eventually, Bartolus would raid and pillage both Macedon and Epirus for decades, even managing to plant a Macedonian puppet king on the throne, subjecting them to tribute, and even killing another king in battle in 359 BC. For Epirus, it was now unite or die. It is during the early 4th century, thanks largely to the threat of the Dardanian kingdom Bartolus, that some of the tribes of Epirus had begun to unify into a single entity. According to Plutarch, the first enactor of change was Therippus, alternately known as Therippas, depending on which translation you go by. Therippus was the Molossian prince who received an Athenian education and later honorary citizenship in his stay during the Peloponnesian War and thanks to the intellectual superiority of the most noble Hellenes, Therippus brought civilization to the Epirot peoples in the form of the rule of law. Well, believe Plutarch if you must, but it's more likely that this development had been gradually occurring for decades, since contact with the southern Greek world had intensified since the middle of the 5th century. The general structure of the Epirot political life at the time of the Peloponnesian War was complicated, since the various tribes of the region were not necessarily consistent. Some of the tribes had no kings, while others like those of the Molossians were more centralized in terms of political authority. To spearhead unification would be the Molossian royal line, who were able to gradually incorporate other tribes into the domain, and over time the end-all word for Epirot for Greeks would soon become Molossian, since they were the largest political entity of the region. Inscriptions survive that date to the 370s that show decrees proclaimed by the now called Molossian state, whereby it lists the names of ten tribes. Clearly, they've seemed to have been incorporated into some sort of alliance with a Molossian tribe at its head. Aristotle, in his politics, even compliments the Molossian kingship for being able to incorporate territory into its domain. Whether it was done by military force or diplomatic ends, or both, it remains to be seen but it is more than reasonable to think that the Epirots were capable of forming alliances to defend against the Dardanians to the north, considering that there were reports of Epirot tribes lending their armies to other Epirot tribes for campaigning during the Peloponnesian War, 
It also helps that the Molossians were able to take control of the holy sanctuary of Dodona as well, formerly a privilege held by the Thesprotians. It is therefore assumed by one scholar's opinion that the unified Molossian state of Epirus can trace its origins to at least 386 or 385 BC. We also see that with increasing political complexity, the Epirotes have been experimenting in terms of urbanization and the construction of fortified cities dating long before 385, so Plutarch's analysis is probably inaccurate. The transformation would not be without its growing pains. As I stated before, the kingdom of Bartolus was a persistent threat. In 385, the Molossians engaged in a battle with the Illyrians, managing to drive them out of Epirus with the help of Sparta but at the cost of 15,000 soldiers, considered a horrendous loss in the Greek world in terms of manpower. But instead of returning, Bartolus directed his attention to Macedon instead. The chaos caused by the Illyrians had pushed the Macedonians and Molossians to come to terms, and even enter into an alliance during the reign of the up-and-coming Macedonian king, Philip II, who was able to finally crush Bartolus in 358 BC ending 40 years of Illyrian warfare and drastically reducing the territory of the kingdom. To secure a further alliance, Philip was entered into a marriage alliance with the Molossian king Arabus by way of his niece, my favorite of all early Hellenistic or Greek queens, Olympias. The match was originally a whirlwind romance, but Olympias was never content to being one of the many wives in Philip's entourage especially after giving birth to Alexander the Great. Despite this marriage, Philip turned on Epirus and preemptively declared war in 350. I like to think that Philip was exasperated by the fact that Olympias was far more cunning and ambitious than he had bargained for, and warred against Artabus as punishment. But it's more likely that he viewed the Epirus as a future threat, given their proximity and growing power. Philip managed to capture Olympias' brother, a man named Alexander, but more commonly known as Alexander the Molossus, and brought him to the court as a hostage. In effect, Philip was trying to rear a loyal puppet king, and Alexander benefited from the Greek education and watching Philip's reforms of the Macedonian army. In time, Philip would indeed replace Arabus, planting Alexander Molossus on the throne in 343 BC. Alexander I, as he would now be called, would remain loyal to Macedon and would carry the lessons taught to him by Philip's subjugation over the Greek world. With Philip's blessing, Alexander would unite the Epirot tribes of the Molossians, the Chionians, and Thesprotians under the banner of what would be called the Epirot Alliance, similar in function to the League of Corinth of Philip II, with the Molossian king at the head of it. This was a body comprised of multiple parts, as the king could be challenged by the other tribes if they felt his rule was questionable, but they viewed him as the supreme commander given that the Molossians held the most military power of all the tribes. The kings of Molossia are classified as being a heroic kingship, as Aristotle calls it, being required to lead armies into battle on the front line and engage in ritual sacrifices to make himself more open to the peoples they ruled over. The king had to swear an oath of loyalty each year to ensure that he was holding the best interests of the Molossian Epirot peoples at heart, and in turn, the subjects would also vow to support his throne if he behaved. The kingship was indeed challenged many times, as we shall soon see, and many rulers were driven out of Epirot by the angry subjects. As a king, the line of Alexander Molossus, and eventually Pyrrhus, would not view themselves as kings of Epirus, but rather a Molossian king who led the Epirot League. Alexander I would also reform the army to the style of the new Macedonian way of war, making it one of the great military powers of the Balkans, and was technically independent of Macedon. Still, Alexander remained loyal to Philip, even as Olympias went into self-exile back to her brother and beckoned him to attack Macedon. To further cement his loyalty, Philip offered his daughter Cleopatra, which was technically Alexander I's niece by the way of Olympias, so that's kind of uncomfortable. Even more uncomfortable was the fact that during the wedding of Alexander Molossus and Cleopatra in 336, 
Philip II was assassinated. Alexander Molossus appears to have not been considered a suspect by the other Alexander, Alexander the Great, and thus the Molossian avoided the purges in the coronation of Alexander thanks to years of friendship and mutual support. While Alexander the Great began his campaigns in the year 334 against the tribes of the Balkans, Alexander the Molossian instead was posed for an invasion of his own, Italy. Yes, almost 40 years before Pyrrhus would invade the Italian peninsula and engage with conflicts with the Roman Republic, the Molossian king would be sought to protect the Greek colonies along the eastern Italian coast, who were threatened by the growing power of the Samnites and Lucanian peoples. While they never met on the field of combat, the Romans and Alexander Molossus clearly were aware of each other, having entered into diplomatic talks with one another. The Roman writers often fantasized on what the outcome would have been if the Romans actually fought the Epirots, believing it to be the closest they ever came to fighting Alexander the Great. Obviously, the Romans would have won, at least in the opinions of authors like Livy. Regardless of any Roman intervention, the campaign for the Molossian was brutal, finding the same challenges as the Romans during their wars with the Samnites in implementing the phalanx on hilly terrain or dealing with the hit-and-run tactics of the more mobile Italians. The culmination of all of these efforts would end on the field of Pandosia, near the city of Brutium. In 331, Alexander would engage in battle with the Italians, and ultimately die on the battlefield. Livy paints the last words of the Molossian king as one of bitter regret, believing that the other Alexander was gaining glory by conquering eastern women while he had fought the most valiant barbarians and failed. Ignoring the Roman patriotism, the loss of the king left Molossi in a bit of a bind, so to speak. At the time, Epirus was struggling under factional strife, thanks to the fighting between Antipater, the standing regent for Macedon while Alexander the Great was on his eastern campaigns, and Olympias, who had tried rallying Epirus' support to get rid of their hated rival. The new king of Molossia, a cousin of Alexander Molossus, was Aeacides, and he did not wish to incur the wrath of Antipater nor Alexander the Great, and Olympias was largely left as a stand-in at the court to nurse her grudge. Things continued for many years, until word came in 323 that Alexander the Great had died in the city of Babylon. With no visible heir in sight, the question of Macedon's next direction was in question. More importantly, what would happen to Epirus, especially with someone as ruthless as Olympias making it her base of power? It is during the wars of the Diadochoi, when the remnants of Alexander the Great's empire were fought over after his death by the successor generals, that our series protagonist, Pyrrhus, enters into the world stage. In terms of our sources, we lose the Roman historian Livy's account at the time of Pyrrhus' invasion of Italy, and what we have left is in fragmentary accounts and epitomes of authors like Justin and Diodorus Siculus. Pyrrhus reportedly wrote memoirs and treaties on the art of war, which unfortunately have not survived, but they were widely read and influential to later generals, above all else, Hannibal Barca. Our most important source on Pyrrhus remains Plutarch, who thankfully dedicated a biography of Pyrrhus in his Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. And so we have many wonderful anecdotes about Pyrrhus to color his life. So let us begin. In 319, Pyrrhus was born to his father Aeacides and his mother Phythia. Much like the turbulent times of the region, young Prince Pyrrhus's world would almost immediately be thrown into chaos, and his life would be in serious danger. As a refresher to the early stages of the wars of the Diadochoi, Macedon was thrown into a succession crisis by Alexander the Great's death in 323. Two heirs were ultimately chosen to rule, the half-wit Philip Aridaeus and Alexander the Great's biological son, Alexander IV, who was still just an infant. Serving as the regent of Macedon would be Antipater, long loyal to the Argead house. But by this time, Antipater was a very old man, 
and in 319 he died, leaving the post of regency vacant. Many thought that Antipater would naturally choose as a successor his son, the irascible Cassander, and Cassander himself thought so as well. When the will was revealed, it turns out that Antipater had ignored his son's desires, and he had instead chosen a man named Polyperkin, a rather mediocre officer who would quickly find himself outclassed in an age of titans. Cassander was upset by his father's decision, to say the least, and a civil war in Macedon broke out, as Cassander attempted to run Polyperkin out of power. Unfortunately for Pyrrhus, King Aeacides had backed the wrong guy. Supporting Polyperkin, given the alliance between Polyperkin and Aeacides' relative Olympias, Aeacides had attempted to levy an army to support his cousin, but many of the Epirot soldiers serving under him had actually refused to march against Macedon and rebelled, essentially forcing Aeacides to sit outside the fight. Once Polyperkin was driven out of Macedon and Olympias executed in 316, Cassander turned his vengeance against Epirus. Aeacides was kicked out of Molossia by Cassander's supporters, and in a dramatic retelling, the loyal servants of the royal family bundled up young Pyrrhus and fled north through the wilderness to the one place you least expect, the court of the Dardanian kingdom of the Illyrians. The current king, a man called Glaucius, was hesitant on receiving the exiled royal family, knowing full well that he could bring down the hammer of Macedon upon his head. According to Plutarch, while Phythia was supplicating and begging for sanctuary, an infant Pyrrhus had ambled over towards Glaucius and imitated his mother without understanding what he was exactly doing, grasping the king's legs. This melted the old king's heart, and he took pity on Pyrrhus, taking the young boy into his home and raising among his own children. This bond was apparently so strong that Cassander offered 200 talents for Glaucius to give Pyrrhus up, but the king refused. In time, Pyrrhus would be brought up as a warrior prince at the court of Glaucius. In some of the most bizarre descriptions of physical characteristics I have ever read, Plutarch describes Pyrrhus as a stern-looking young man, inspiring the fear of a king rather than his majesty. So he probably wasn't a looker. But on top of that, Instead of having a set of individual teeth, it is claimed that he had one solid bone on both the top and bottom of his mouth, with little indentations in these mega teeth. Nobody can seem to offer a reasonable medical explanation of what it could have been, so the frightful image will just have to haunt your dreams instead. There are also a number of weird associations with Pyrrhus, such as his apparent possession of a magic toe. Not just any magic toe, mind you, but one that allowed him to cure people afflicted with conditions of the spleen by pressing his right foot on the area of the affected patient. And this toe was apparently tough, surviving Pyrrhus's eventual cremation, and was venerated like a holy relic of an early Christian saint. Though Plutarch admits that these stories are of a later origin, so they are pretty dubious. In 306... At the age of 13, Pyrrhus exploited the chaos of the Third Diodohoi War by retaking his throne in Molossia with the aid of Glaucius. Before this, Pyrrhus's father Aeacides had managed to briefly retake the throne in 313, before Cassander had met him on the field of battle and killed him, forcing Cassander to buy the loyalty of the Epirot nobility, who were now kingless young again. Pyrrhus's stay wouldn't last for long since the Molossian supporters of Cassander would again jucked him out of Pyrrhus only a few years later in 302. It is fortunate that Pyrrhus managed to find an ally outside of Illyria to seek shelter with, the family of Antigonus the One-Eyed, and his flamboyant son Demetrius Polyarchetes, the would-be kings of Macedon ruling out of Asia Minor. Demetrius had married Pyrrhus' sister Didymea and took in his brother-in-law as an officer during his campaigns. It is here that Pyrrhus was most likely exposed to the ways of the Macedonian art of war, serving under the command of some of the best generals in the world, and it would act as a potent trading ground for Pyrrhus's future skills. Pyrrhus spent much of his time obsessing over war and combat, rarely doing anything else, since he believed it to be the only subject that a king should be studying. If I can't stress it enough, Pyrrhus really, really liked warfare 
so much that in a world where he was surrounded by men solely devoted to leading armies and conquering nations at the age of 70 and 80, he was the odd one, where he couldn't even hold a normal dinner conversation about comparing the skill of flute players without interjecting that so-and-so was the better general. I mean, Alexander, Mr. Not Enough Worlds to Conquer the Great, was capable of talking about other subjects besides military matters. Still, Pyrrhus was a respected member of the Antigonid entourage, considered generous to his friends, and had impressed his peers and superiors with his talent for commanding men, prompting Antigonus to remark that the greatest general at the time would be Pyrrhus, if he lived long enough. Ominous. In 301, at the tender age of 18 years, Pyrrhus would fight alongside Demetrius Polyarchites in the heavy cavalry on the plains of Ipsus in modern Turkey against the massive anti-Antigone coalition headed by the other Diadohoi in one of the largest battles of antiquity. Despite the defeats of the Antigonids and the death of Antigonus, Pyrrhus would display considerable courage and skill on the battlefield and managed to escape capture in order to hightail it back to Antigonid strongholds in Greece. He remained loyal to his brother-in-law Demetrius and would keep these under his protection for the Antigonid king. Demetrius, on the other hand, would be negotiating peace accords with some of the other successor generals, most notably Ptolemy I, who had taken control of Egypt in the initial period after Alexander's death. As part of the settlement, Demetrius needed to hand over a bargaining chip, and who else to offer as a political hostage than young Pyrrhus? So, in 298, Pyrrhus was shuffled over to yet another court, traveling to Alexandria in Egypt. Although this would seem like another turn for the worst, Pyrrhus' experience at the Ptolemaic court would actually be a blessing in disguise. The Molossian's skill and potential was quickly recognized, and he was ingratiated into the royal family thanks largely to the patronage and favoritism of Berenike, the primary wife of Ptolemy. It was through her efforts that Pyrrhus would be married to her daughter Antigone, who was a loyal and devoted wife to Pyrrhus, who in turn honored her with a colony named Antigonea. Now that Ptolemy and Pyrrhus were tied together through marriage, Ptolemy would supply money, ships, and a small military force to allow his son-in-law to retake his throne in Epirus for the second time most likely to ensure that Cassander I in Macedon wouldn't try anything funny against Ptolemy. Rather than engaging in a campaign of reconquest, Pyrrhus decided to be more diplomatic, and came to terms with the current Epirot king, Neoptolemus, vowing to jointly rule together. In a ceremony at Dodona, the religious center of Epirus, both kings publicly swore oaths to serve the good of their subjects, and carry out sacrifices to Zeus Arius. But of course, we can't have some sort of event like this without political intrigue. During the after-party, Pyrrhus is said to have disrespected a cupbearer named Myrtilus by giving the gift of oxen to another in his retinue, arousing Myrtilus's jealousy. The cupbearer would seduce a man in Neoptolemus's camp named Gilon, and convinced him to have Pyrrhus poisoned on Neoptolemus's orders. Word came down the grapevine to Antigone, and she relayed this information to Pyrrhus. Neoptolemus was invited to dinner, and then was personally killed at Pyrrhus's hand. The situation seems fishy, as Plutarch even mentions that Pyrrhus was nursing ambitions of expanding his slice of the kingdom before this revelation, and also had the support of the Epirots against Neoptolemus. It also may serve as a parallel storytelling method to the conspiracies experienced by both Alexander the Great and Philip II, where a disgruntled subordinate like Pausanias of Orestes or Ermolaus are supported by their fellow male lover Eromenos and would plot an assassination against the monarch who insulted them. Whatever was the case, in 296, Pyrrhus was now the uncontested master of Epirus. With the birth of his first son, named Ptolemy in honor of Pyrrhus' father-in-law, his marriage to Lanassa, the daughter of the Sicilian tyrant Agathocles, and an additional dowry of the island of Corsaira, all was falling into place for Pyrrhus. He could now rule as his father Aeacides did before him, securely and comfortably. However, peace is not what Pyrrhus would be after. In the rest of the Hellenistic world, 
the wars of the Diadohoi were still raging between the surviving generals. Macedon was undergoing a civil war, and the prospect of glory through conquest would become more and more appealing to our protagonist. So, it is here that we will leave the narrative, and next time, we will cover the wars between Pyrrhus and the other successor kingdoms, and eventually, his first steps on to the Italian shores. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. Unfortunately, the next episode of the series is probably going to take a bit more time to do since I will be dedicating most of my free time for the next few weeks to exams and studying for grad school. In the meanwhile, you can check out the Silk Road History Podcast, hosted by Nathan Cherry. If you're looking to fill your need for Central Asian history, he's your guy, and I'll provide links to his show in the podcast description and show notes. I also direct you all to my website for show notes, maps, diagrams, and sources used during the episode to help you along with the material. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and more. And if you want to stay updated to the show's production and or get in contact with me, you can follow me on Twitter at Twitter handle HellenisticPOD or my new Facebook page, which I have finally buckled, which is also listed under the Hellenistic Age podcast. These links will all be provided in the show notes. So, until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast.